Oh, well, hello there. Wasn't expecting you back so soon, but now that you are, welcome back. And welcome back indeed. Because it's time once again to dust off and remaster yet another audio article from the Industry Broadcast Vaults. Going through these first 50 or 60 articles kind of feels like Christmas every couple of days, just because the influx of new authors that joined us in rapid succession was so, and is still, so exciting. So today we've got the first article from Yours Dormans to hit the scene. A very well-respected voice in game design theory for sure, Yours got a master's degree in cultural studies after finishing a thesis on the grammar of visual design. Impressed yet? Well, after graduation, he continued to expand his academic knowledge and started to shift his attention to something a little bit more relevant. That being the study of games. Through his website, yoursdormans.nl, he publishes articles and reviews of books about games and game design theory. Right now, he's working as a lecturer, teaching courses on game design and development, He's also doing his PhD on game design methodology, and occasionally he works as a freelance game designer and consultant. We're damn lucky and grateful to have him on board and for lending his insight to the cause. And generously so, because today's a beast of an article. Maybe not a behemoth like a couple articles back, but a beast by anybody's standards. As they say, though, the beast waits for no man. Well, at least that's what I say. Because this beast ain't waiting any longer. You see, my name is Ryan Wianko, and this is Industry Broadcast. The Hacker, New Mythical Content of Narrative Games. Let's start with the abstract. Mythology and its general relevance for popular culture is a framework of growing importance for understanding the way narrative games function as cultural artifacts within society. Myths are better compatible than conventional stories with the key characteristics of games, interactivity, world simulation, and gameplay. Furthermore, Games as a technologically advanced medium open up new mythological perspectives on contemporary society and technology, a perspective where the hacker is proposed as the new hero of this day and age. Part 1. Introduction For what had Prometheus done in the first place? He had given men a power-up. Stephen Poole Storytelling has a long history, and over the years, Many media were devised to relate tales. Games are one of the most recent additions to the possible narrative canvases. Although there had been long a heated debate on the subject, most scholars would agree that storytelling is a factor in some games. For some games, story is just providing color to the central gaming action. Others have higher narrative aspirations and are trying to carve out new paths to the ever-elusive holy grail of interactive storytelling more often than not, with only limited success. Up until this point, games are not really known for the quality of tales they spin. When compared to traditional, linear forms of storytelling, such as the printed novel or featured film, games are certainly lacking. Game characters are often flat and stereotypical. Plots are considered weak and predictable. Although it may not be exactly fair to compare a medium as young in its games to the more mature cinema or the venerable printed word, some insist that games will never be able to catch up. The way I see it, the celebrated quality of interactivity in games goes against the authorial control required to create a narrative masterpiece. Several scholars, including myself, work very, very hard to find ways to resolve the paradox between freedom of the player and control of the author. 
but so far no definitive strategies have emerged. One might start to believe that critics who say successful strategies that lead to the creation of narrative games on par with most important works of linear fiction might never be found. At the same time, though, mythology is gaining ground in the study of narrative games as a relevant framework to approach game stories. The mythological sources and aspirations of many fantasy games are obvious, and the frontier myth is a popular template applied to popular science fiction or action cinema and games alike. If the mythological interpretation of games reveals one thing, it's that most myths are relatively technophobic and conservative at the very least. As someone who does not particularly identify himself with those notions, but also as someone who enjoys science fiction in general, this doesn't seem satisfactory. How the hell can I come to enjoy that particular type of storytelling while I oppose its typical message? To resolve this paradox, I'm just going to go ahead and investigate the mythological nature and meaning of games from the perspective of media theory, ludology, and social mythology. In particular, I plan on investigating the way media and mythology shape society in general, and in narrative games in particular. On to part two, storytelling media. Marshall McLuhan is notorious for the power he attributed to media to shape human society. His history is divided in four eras that coincide with the development of dominant media. The area of spoken word comes first, for example, then script, then printed word, and finally electronic media, perhaps best interpreted as our current computer age. Of these, McLuhan resented the era of printed word the most. Although he admits the printing press improved education and literacy, it also inspired nationalism and the accumulation of power by military and commercial corporations. Instead of liberating the individual, he says it took away his power to express and react. And I quote, Perhaps the most significant of gifts of typography to man is that of detachment and non-involvement. Although his observations have been nuanced by later media scholars, most notably by Raymond Williams, the relevance of these for storytelling are very evident. In most literary circles, the printed novel is still regarded as the most superior medium for storytelling, with theatre and certain types of cinema playing second and third fiddle respectively. Other media such as face-to-face -face storytelling, graphic novels, television, and computer games compare quite poorly to the standards set by the printed novel. A closer inspection of common ways to define stories and storytelling reveals that these have been shaped much by the medium of the printed word and its particular traits. At the heart of most definitions is that a story relates a series of chronological and causal related events, with beginning, a middle, and a closure at the end. It's no wonder that media that are sequential and authored in advance are damn good at telling stories just like this. McLuhan might comment that such media shape the way we tell stories, so that it reflects their sequential and pre-authored nature, and has little to do with the most superior shape of stories themselves, if such a thing can be said to exist. To better understand and appreciate the stories told by other media than the traditional media of the era of the printed word, we need to resort to theories devised for these media. A well-known example from the world of comics is the work of Scott McCloud. In search of the elementary structure of comics, he proposes the panel and the way it functions in relation to other panels on the page. The magic of comics, he says, is found in the space between the panels. The reader fills in the blanks herself and relates the depicted events in the panels. She provides her own closure based on a visual and verbal interpretation of the frames. I really think that this is a pivotal point made by McLeod, as he states, if visual iconography is the vocabulary of comics, closure is its grammar. And since our definition of comics hinges on the arrangement of elements, then in a very real sense, comics is closure.
Interesting, the type of closure McLeod talks about does not depend on pre-authored causal relations in a text, but is constructed in the mind of the reader, cued by the visual layout. Association, juxtaposition, and similarity are far more important for this type of closure than the sequences and differences of printed word. We see in a later work that MacLeod travels even further down this alternative narrative path when he starts considering just how comics are best adapted to digital forms. The computer screen, he observes, makes only for a poor substitution of a page in a comic book. And when single screen panels are used, much power of the comic is lost. Instead, he proposes to use the screen as a window into an infinite page, where the panels are laid out unconstricted, where panel interrelation is free and expressive. MacLeod manages to use the move of comics to the computer to play up the strength of the first, which shows insight into particular attributes of his chosen medium, and how these relate to the expressive art of telling stories. His work led MacLeod to a very different perspective on stories than the one advocated by traditional literature. Stories are not just about the relation of events, they are not histories. Rather, he states that storytellers in all media and all cultures are, at least partially, in the business of creating worlds. This perspective on stories seems to be much more suited to games as well. Games are very good at creating worlds, and many scholars have reflected on this ability. For example, Henry Jenkins makes a strong case for architectural approach to designing game stories. In addition, the larger interpretive freedom MacLeod grants the reader of comics might be a welcome step away from a theory of narrative that makes creativity the province of the genius of the author only. Part 3 Games as a Medium for Storytelling You can start to see that when we shift our attention to computer games as a medium, a few characteristics particular to games that shape the way we tell stories come into sharp focus. These characteristics are interactivity, simulation, and gameplay. In this article, I wish to address these terms in the most generic possible way. This is partly because different games implement these aspects in very different ways, and partly because there is not much consensus on these terms among scholars of games. I also really hope that you agree that this generic approach to these characteristics suffices for this article. I'm kind of trying to comment on the narrative potential of games in general. The exact implementation of narrative in games is best left to the individual craftsmanship of game designers and interactive storytellers. Interactivity is heralded as one of the hallmarks of new computerized media, and computer games are often placed at the pinnacle as one of the most interactive media to date. Although there are many ways to understand interactivity, with games, interactivity is generally understood as the power of the user to interact with the game in such a way that the game text the sounds and images it produces is changed, so that, in some ways, it reflects on the player's choices. This type of interactivity is far beyond the interpretive freedom of a reader of linear, non-interactive text. Interactivity starts to grant some control over the game to the player to the extent that the game designer no longer produces a text, as the author of a novel does. Rather, the player produces one within the framework provided by the game designer. The job of the game designer is to create a tool, a semiotic space or a machine for the player to use and craft his or her own stories. Unfortunately, giving up authorial control seems to be a rather hard thing to do. Few writers are prepared to vest enough confidence in the storytelling ability of their audience, while the audience also seems reluctant to pick up the challenge to entertain themselves. As Stephen Poole expresses the sentiment, we don't want to have to make crucial narrative decisions that might, in effect, spoil the story for us. We want to have our cake and eat it too. The perspective of games as interactive machines ties in nicely with games as simulations. The logic that is embedded in the machine can be described as a system of rules that model in-game world. 
The game world might be taken quite literally as a fictional playground for the player, but some worlds are more abstract and have no real world counterpart or consist only in mathematical relations of various game elements. The most game worlds are somewhere in between these two extremes. The old game of chess is a good example. This game metaphorically represents two opposing armies at a field of battle, but the abstract rules that make up the game are more important than any reference to any real historical place, time, or battle. Simulation in computer games has a very long history. Well, as long as computer games goes, that is. In his early work, Chris Crawford already drew the same parallels between simulation and games as between technical drawing and a work of art. More recently, Gonzalo Frasca worked on the notion of simulation as an alternative to narrative or textual representation, an alternative that takes into account the status of a game not as text, but as a machine for the production of texts. Most scholars stress the importance of the expressive power of the simulation itself over the direct representation of a fictional or non-fictional reality. As Stephen Poole argues, Video games will become more interesting artistically if they abandon thoughts of recreating something that looks like the real world, and instead try to invent utterly novel ones that work in amazing but consistent ways, because a realistic simulation is always built on a foundation of compromise. Gameplay, finally, is probably the most fluid of these three aspects. Although every gamer has an intuitive grasp on what gameplay he or she likes and what gameplay he or she dislikes, finding a solid definition of gameplay is pretty damn difficult. Most people will acknowledge that gameplay is the thing the player does while playing. Pretty simple. And good gameplay amounts to a certain enjoyable quality of this activity. However, it's not uncommon to link gameplay to the notion of flow. A state of mind described by psychologist Mihai Sixcent Mihai, a name which I, being Ryan here, have just got to say is probably the hardest to pronounce correctly based on how it's spelt. Look it up, look up Flo, and then tell me if his name sounds anything like how it's spelt. It doesn't. No matter how many times you read it, it doesn't. And trust me, I've read that name a lot. Anyways. The state of flow in which the player loses track of time, becomes unaware of his or her surroundings, and is totally immersed in the game. To achieve flow, the player needs to feel challenged, but not too much. She must feel in control as well. Furthermore, she needs clear goals and some sort of feedback. You see, a well-designed game delivers all of these experiences, and it's easy to see that good interactivity design and coherent simulation contribute to flow and gameplay. These three aspects are, of course, not the only aspects crucial to gaming. For example, one might point out that games involve some sort of conflict and its resolution, like winning or losing. However, most stories also involve conflict and some sort of resolution, such as closure. And if anything, it's pretty, pretty hard to argue that conflict in games is often represented in the most primitive form. That being violence. Whereas other means have found much more sophisticated ways of depicting conflict. Considering the relative young age of computer games, this should not come as a huge surprise. What is surprising, however, is that games already show signs of expanding their palette beyond violence alone. In considering these aspects of games and how they relate to storytelling, a common mistake is often encountered. The games industry has a tendency to focus on realism and transparency in order to create immersion. It almost seems like they think that the player will only be able to suspend his or her disbelief when the simulated game world is realistic enough. This requires the controls to be as transparent and intuitive as possible and rules out anything that might break the spell. Game scholars as well often retain that games as expressive media are less sophisticated than other types of media. For example, in his recent account of Game Time, 
which, as a side note, is an up-and-coming article on industry broadcast, Jesper Jewell argues that chronologically discontinuous games work against immersion because they call attention to themselves as games. In his view, it's something that might work in film or a book, but goes against the ideal experience of a game. Unfortunately for Jesper, I tend to disagree. Games lack an established and expressive grammar to communicate discontinuous time, not the potential to express it effectively. You gotta remember that books and cinema weren't invented with structures to represent discontinuous time from the very beginning. And when the necessary grammar evolved, it took time for the audience to adjust. It might very well be that the most current games are always played in the now, as Jewel insists, but that's not necessarily a condition. David J. Bolter and Diane Gramala argue against transparent interface design. They say that the most successful digital consumer products are not merely transparent, but instead make the interface part of the experience. It seems like a viable strategy for designing games as well. I mean, gameplay consists of interacting with the game, and to think about the presses of a button and to integrate that experience into the game will give the player a greater sense of control. Now control leads to flow through which immersion can be reached. This is much closer to the transcendental cyborg consciousness famously described by Ted Friedman, which quite literally recalls Marshall McLuhan's notion of media as the extensions of man. More expressive grammar and structures in games will only enhance the power at the command of the player and deepen his experience. Hmm. What then are the types of stories games are suited to relate? Well, for one thing, games are certainly part of popular culture now, and as being such, they should appeal to a wide audience, often also by economic necessity. They are very good at delivering worlds, and should be able to let the player roam free inside of them. This makes games in many ways a closer cousin to television, episodic comics, and cross-media events than to literature or cinema. They are part of a folk tradition of storytelling rather than they should aspire to storm the vestibules of high art and literature. To put it simply, games are excellent vehicles for modern myths. Part 4. A Mythological Approach to Storytelling The emergence of interactive storytelling in games and outside games has inspired a renewed interest in mythology. You see, myths are among the oldest forms of storytelling. They stem from an age before written records even existed. And I mean, these days, we like to think of imagining ways in which the shamans told their stories around a campfire interactively. Most of this, of course, is guesswork, although the ritual reenactment of certain myths are indeed ancient examples of interactive storytelling. Games tend to copy more the structure of myths alone. It's not enough to assume that the mythological content of many games only offers shallow escapist entertainment, for there is more power in myths than that. Myths have served a very particular role in society. They teach us to live. It is a perspective on myth that has been popularized by Joseph Campbell. In his key work, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, he starts to present his theory on the monomyth. Campbell does a pretty good job at showing that many stories from around the world and from many different sources all deal with life, death, and the rites of passage. It's as if one single story, the monomyth, you could say, it, the adventure of the hero underlies all other stories, although they might focus on different parts. Basically, the monomyth teaches us to overcome life's obstacles and to step into the footsteps of our parents. They show us how to live and experience life. Towards the end of his work, Campbell observes that today too much has changed for the monomyth to retain much relevance. Scientific progress and liberal democratic ideals have transformed society too much. No longer is it necessary to become as your parents, and people are more free to choose their own path in life. The symbols of the past seem to have lost their value. Still, narrative works that follow the monomyth closely, or are directly inspired by it, are still created and are still hugely successful. Two of the best-known examples are the Star Wars series and the Lord of the Rings.
It would seem, then, that myths that Campbell described keep emerging in popular culture. Campbell's work has found its way into many storytellers' handbooks. Another mythological take on popular fiction can be found in the work of film scholar Jeff King. Jeff recounts the frontier myth that inspired many popular films such as the heyday of the western, especially in the big action flicks of Hollywood. In King's account, the frontier myth also serves to help its audience to make sense of the world. It's a pretty basic premise, and that's that of the strong male hero purified by a hard and simple life on the frontier. He's a guy that fights the technological and bureaucratic forces of modern hedonistic society and restores the family unit, or small community, because he puts more trust in his wits and intuition than in technology. The frontier can take many guises, from an American frontier in the original, via any wild and untouched stretch of nature, to the vast unexplored stretches of deep space. The frontier myth pits mankind against technology, and condemns a society that relies too much on the latter. Actually, the frontier myth can be pretty easily identified with many action films and works of fantasy and science fiction, including the aforementioned Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. Both series antagonize the industrial perfection of Saruman, or the Empire, while contrasting it with the nature-loving heroes or the ramshackle technology of the rebels. Games frequently use the frontier myth, a clear-cut example could be found in Half-Life, where the government turns out to be the real enemy after they fail to contain the aliens and to harness their own technology. In this case, the frontier myth comes to our hero, Gordon Freeman, and his perilous trek through the alien-infested complex to prepare him for the real encounter with the enemy. The fact that the government ended up using Freeman to eliminate the alien threat is a pretty common twist, and it mostly serves to underline their inability, despite their technological advantage. As all proper myths, the frontier myth holds some relevance in today's life. In this case, technology is seen as a factor that is changing society, and not for the better. It reflects the conservative, almost Luddite sentiment that apparently strikes a chord with a large part of the audience. Finding meaning in an increasingly anonymous society is difficult, and for many people, it's very hard to recognize that the feeling of being enslaved by the technology that's supposed to make life easier. It is fairly ironic, but not quite surprising considering the nature of the audience, who seems completely oblivious to the fact that these stories are often mediated by the same technologies and are controlled by similarly large corporations that the myths antagonize. The Success of the Interactive Myth Our appetite for mythological content is not the only reason of the success a mythological approach to storytelling in games might have. I find that as a strategy for interactive storytelling, it holds some promise, yet at the same time it seems to go well with some recent trends and practices within the industry. The mythical form of storytelling seems to fit the media forms of games rather well. Games, or according to Scott McCloud, any form of story, aims at delivering worlds. Most myths, too, concern themselves with the creation of a mythical universe. Despite the relevance myths might hold for their public, few people mistake the fictional character of the myth for facts, or at least they should distinguish between myth and reality. Joseph Campbell states that people sometimes would do well to refer to the myths outside their own religion, for he feels when they do not take them for facts, their message comes across more clearly. Various myths often combined into a mythology, that being a collection of myths of a culture that deal with the same characters or locations. <laughs> 
The cycle of Norse myths are a well-known example. These tales relate to the dealings of the old gods of Scandinavia. Although some myths should be clearly placed at the beginning of the cycle and others towards the end, the tales in the middle are largely interchangeable. Because in the middle, the characters have been well established and do not need to change much, as they have their roles to play, reflecting their part in life or in the populace. Each new iteration of the same metaphorical conflict offers a new perspective on the represented themes. In this regard, John Fiske draws a parallel between mythology and television series, where every show is often a similar reiteration of the same conflict. Within an episode, the syntagmatic chain of events may reach closure, but paradigmatic oppositions of character and situations never can. A pretty similar observation could be made for video games, as most seem to reiterate the same paradigmatic opposition over and over and over again, even when the cast and the set change more frequently. At the same time, the recent trend in many cultural industries is to make repeated use of the same intellectual properties. It is expensive and considerably risky to keep investing in new fictional characters and worlds when the audience displays an unquenchable thirst for the same heroes. As a result, there are more sequels and more adaptations from one media to another. These days, a fictional character might start off as a minor comic book character that is ported to the silver screen before he or she stars in his or her own television series or computer game. This fictional universe that can span many media texts and artifacts is built around one coherent core that functions much like an ancient mythology. It represents a particular outlook on life. Interestingly, such a fictional universe is inherently much more interactive than the content of a linear story, as fans can more freely explore or even contribute to this world. Many minor additions to these cross-media constructs are designed to facilitate such visits. In his discussions of the frontier myth, Jeff King includes examples from film-themed theme park rides. He argues that these rarely aim at delivering the same story as the main cinematic source. Rather, they are designed to make the visitor feel part of the same fictional universe. Curiously, many of such theme park rides seem to include a moment where, apparently, something goes wrong. These moments help the audience to suspend their disbelief and cross the boundary into the fictional world. It helps them to forget that, for a moment, they are safely strapped into a cart. It can be regarded as a form of media transparency. Now, although I don't think that it's fully transparent, and it takes just a little bit more to make the audience forget that what they are seeing is only a show. In fact, as I argued above, I doubt that these attractions should even aim for full transparency or risk stopping enjoyable. If anything, this common strategy of going off the beaten track illustrates better the willingness of the audience to buy into the fantasy. To some extent, we want these stories to be true. We welcome the chance to be able to participate and enjoy them as if they were real, in the safe knowledge that nothing really bad can happen. This willingness of the audience to play their part in the communal fantasy is one of the foundations of an interesting structure for interactive storytelling discussed by Mary Lore Ryan. It's called Fractal Storytelling. She takes the idea from Neil Stephenson's science fiction novel The Diamond Age, in which an interactive storybook plays a prominent role. Fractal storytelling revolves around the idea that people enjoy stories that, to some extent, are predictable. There really are only so many stories that can be told, and we're pretty good at recognizing them. Start with the words, once upon a time, and we'll all know that we're dealing with a fairy tale, and easily predict the way the tale will develop. Horror films and action films are also notorious for using the same narrative developments and devices over and over again. Satirical takes on these genres, such as Scary Movie or Last Action Hero, are good examples where these mechanics are clearly foregrounded. Funnily enough, contrary to popular appeals to originality and creative genius, more often than not, the audience just wants the same action spike stories, at best with some minor variations. Interactive storytellers 
can make use of this appetite of the audience by delivering what people want to hear and see. Authors shouldn't struggle with the player for narrative control. Rather, the author and the player should cooperate. The author can expect that when the player buys a violent game, he or she does not expect pacifist solutions to be part of it, and therefore the player should not be disappointed when these are indeed not part of the game. Games have already been described as a restrictive language where rules govern a world where we are challenged to pursue goals in indirect or inefficient ways. Likewise, stories often also rely on a restricted language, classical, traditional, and modern myths in particular. Aristotle's theory of the drama is a good example of a restrictive language that is still applied to this day. In all likelihood, these languages correspond to different genres while, at the same time, they might share a common universal core. The interplay between stories, games, and these genre languages strongly resembles the way languages function in the social linguistic theories of popular and the high culture of Mikhail Bikpen. The idea of the fractal story helps the interactive storytelling to focus on giving the player freedom where it matters. Accommodating for all possible actions of the player is not very efficient when the goal of the story is more or less fixated by its initial premise. The abduction of a princess by a dragon leaves little doubt as to how the plot will end. However, the eventual demise of the dragon can take on several different meanings depending on the trajectory of the player. As Barry Atkins puts it, the satisfaction of such stories, at least at the level of discrete plot fragments, rests not in the matter of plot sophistication, but in matters of sophistication of storytelling. The question is never will the prince overcome the dragon, but how will the prince overcome the dragon? Now this still leaves a lot of room for different stories. The interactive plot is not an end in itself, rather it is a means to create interactive stories that are the result of the creative collaboration between storyteller and player. In the end, it's not about the structure of the game, but about the experience of the player, and really the best way to give the player an experience that he or she likes is to establish a symbolic playground rife with dramatic, paradigmatic oppositions and then leave it to the player to explore at his or her own leisure. Because when the symbolic oppositions are interesting enough, when she has enough freedom to explore and experiment with these, then the player will want to return over and over and, and, over, and, over, and over. over. That way, the interactive story can grow with the player, the game creates stories that, within certain parameters, also reflect back to the player. Part 6. Stories Games Might Tell Closer inspection of the stories presented in games reveals that myths are indeed already popular content for games. This is no surprise. Campbell's Journey of the Hero and King's Frontier Myth are both very useful templates for the analysis of games, as is the case for many science fiction, fantasy, and action stories. Now, most of these instances of these myths are not really known for their progressive message. I mean, we've already seen that a lot of films produced within the Hollywood studio model, with its reliance on technology and scale, advocate a sentiment that goes against their own model of production. At first glance, games really don't appear very different, which is strange to say the least because you'd expect the message one of these technologically advanced artifacts to communicate is being much more progressive and a hell of a lot less technophobic. However, there are alternative avenues to interpret the mythological content in games. Ian Bogust holds the view that video games in fact represent a new mode of thinking and organizing that he associates with complex systems. It is a way of thinking that favors unit operations over top-down system thinking or system operations. To quote, Unit operations are modes of meaning-making that privilege discrete, disconnected actions over deterministic, progressive systems. It is a term loosely amalgamated from several fields, including software technology, physics, and cybernetics, 
but it could be equally well at home in the world of literary theory. I contend that unit operations represent a shift away from system operations, although neither strategy is permanently detached from the other. System operations refer the old practices of sciences and society to organize everything in large systems that are understood top-down. These days, however, our society and our knowledge has grown so much in scope that a top-down approach ceases to be effective. Most sciences have moved beyond system operations towards unit operations. The emergence of the computer game as a medium with social and cultural significance is a clear indication that culture will follow suit. For what is computer games but a complex and open system? Bogus proposes a comparative computer game criticism that interprets games among similar lines that I have outlined here. Above all, it would seek to understand how video games reveal what might be human. Interpreting games in this way, they might be able to teach us a few lessons that go beyond technological and bureaucratic angst, despite the fact that it still seems to be the most dominant theme in many game stories. The popularity in games of one particular character archetype, the hacker, is particularly promising for the future of game myths. Hackers have become common heroes of many science fiction stories found in games and elsewhere. They are very prominent in the subgenre of cyberpunk, where they are often encountered in their most pure form, being computer whiz kids that use their skills to enter the computers of mega corporations and governments in order to free information and to expose the evil intent of those organizations. Games like System Shock and Deus Ex make extensive use of this theme. William Gibson, one of the genre's classic authors, frequently uses the term console cowboy to refer to these future criminals, data terrorists, or freedom fighters, a term that recalls the frontier myth, and indeed the myth provides us with a meaningful interpretive framework to approach many works of cyberpunk. The new frontiers is now the electronic frontier in cyberspace. We can also encounter the hacker in other stories. Jeff King briefly discusses the hacker nature in The Girl Lex in the film Jurassic Park and contrasts her different, more intuitive approach with that of a computer nerd. This whole film, like the book it's based upon, can be interpreted as a clean-cut example of the frontier myth, but it also serves to illustrate the differences between unit operations and system operations, and represents the former as the more superior of the two. Still, there is an important difference between the hacker and cowboy as the more typical frontier hero. Cowboys seem to live more in the past than hackers do. Cowboys invariably want to restore the countryside and human society to a pure, unspoiled state, untouched by technology. Hackers, on the other hand, usually live by their technological skills. They cannot live without their technology. Hackers differ from their adversaries in their more intuitive, bottom-up approach to technology, which allows them to control the technology rather than being controlled by it. In a sense, the hacker represents a sort of synthesis between the old frontier heroes and the way our world has evolved. The hacker doesn't try to escape modern society, Rather, the hacker shows us how to embrace technology and without giving up our individuality. In this way, the significance of the hacker exceeds the world of games and fiction. For example, hackers would excel in bogus unit operations, and Mackenzie Wark uses the hacker and the hack to describe modern information workers in his political A Hacker Manifesto. Now, the way I see it is that the difference between hackers and cowboys is clearly illustrated when one compares the films The Matrix to Johnny Mnemonic, which both star Keanu Reeves as the role of the hacker. In The Matrix, the hacker Neo finds power within to fight the system. But although this leads to his personal transcendence, the film's main antagonist is clearly the technology itself. The sequels make a point in celebrating a more primitive, tribal society over the world as we know it today. In The Matrix, Neo is more of a cowboy than a hacker. In contrast, Johnny Mnemonic does not really antagonize technology at all. One of its main heroes is the cyber dolphin Jones, an interesting mix between nature and technology.
The antagonist is not technology itself. Instead, the bad guys are with the pharmaceutical corporation that are controlling the technological advances and withholding the cure for the disease that is caused by cyberware. Of course, in the end, they prove to be no match for hacker Johnny and his friends, who, with their superior understanding and bottom-up control, manage to save the day. Now, it should become clear that games are excellent vehicles for the figure of the hacker and the hacker myth. For what is gaming but a bottom-up approach to understanding complex systems? Control, so vital to gameplay, corresponds well to the performance of the hack. Last but not least, the hacker myth points the way forward instead of celebrating the past itself. So, we are in need of new road signs for life, as Joseph Campbell repeatedly states. That the hacker myth holds much more relevance for a contemporary complex society than the way of the cowboy. The hacker, in its many guises, is the newest incarnation of the mythological trickster, and as the trickster has done for the ages, the hacker shows us how to harness technology and how to incorporate it into our lives and into society. Now, as I conclude, I'd just like to say that every medium for storytelling favors its own type of story. Clearly, we cannot and should not compare the stories of games to standards set by quote-unquote high culture of literature or art house cinema. If games are to evolve as a storytelling medium, a form of storytelling should be found that matches the characteristics of games. Mythological storytelling, which shapes many stories in popular media, seems to be pretty well suited to interactive storytelling in general, and in games in particular. The structural form of the myth, with its own restrictive formal rules, can be easily incorporated by games. As mentioned before, the general audience relishes this type of story as they know what to expect, and because it holds relevance to their everyday life, even when the narrative theme is anything but ordinary. The mythological content of popular myth, however, shows a serious conservative and technophobic streak. However, society advances and we need our stories to reflect that change, or at least to help us cope with it. To this end, games, as one of the technologically most advanced media to date, seems to hold the key. They are more accommodating to the emerging myth of the hacker and more and more progressive incarnations of the classic hero. And it's pretty exciting because in this way, games constitute an invaluable platform which can teach us how to deal with modern life in new ways. In this way, games give shape to new mythological content that will in itself shape our lives. And this brings us to the end of yet another fine article from industrybroadcast.com. Again, written by Yours Dormans, and if you want to check out more of his writings, you can always head over to www.yoursdormans.nl. A quick reminder, if you've got five minutes, head over to Twitter and follow us at IB Podcast, or go to Facebook, search for Industry Broadcast, and add us as a friend. My name is Ryan Wienko, signing off, and hoping you join us again next time at industrybroadcast.com where we bring the collective insight of the gaming industry to your ears.